who couldn't come, some, some who um, at the last minute can't come. So we're going to record it and share it if that's okay with all of you. And um, as it is, we have a lovely, a lovely, uh, a lovely tapestry of ladies here. So thank you all for coming. Uh, another core connects Rhode Island event, which um, I sadly has to be on Zoom. Um, we did try another in-person event, which um, was suffering because of COVID. People canceled, couldn't come, whatever. So we're back on Zoom for a little bit. We'll see how it all plays out, hopefully well, and we can meet in person again soon. Um, I am working on an event that I'd like to publicize now in February, and it's um, geared towards um, healthy relationships with uh, your partner. That's the kind of overall um, idea of it. And um, I will share more of that as, as it comes to be, but I wanna do that around um, February 14th. <laughs> um, something on healthy, healthy relationships in uh, the romantic sense of, 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 of our lives. So that's what I'm thinking. Um, just put that on the table. Um, here we are, poetry night. How exciting. So I didn't know what a poetry slam was. And then I found out a poetry slam is uh, very critical. And I thought, oh, no, that's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to share. And at the end of our last panel, we had Thanksgiving, an event with Elizabeth Oakes gave, told over a beautiful poem that just sparked the idea to then have a poetry night. And all of the lovely 10 women who offered to share some of their writings with us is really a treat. And we're really in for a treat tonight. And um, I do have Elizabeth's poem, if we want to hear it again, I'm happy to, she can't come, but she asked if I would like to uh, share it, I'm, I could do that. So um, our lineup tonight, um, many of the ladies are on the call here, um, most of them are, all of them are. Um, we're gonna start with Jill Perlman, and then um, Joanna Brown, Jen Stark, uh, Francine uh, fink Dennistein, Cynthia Scheinberg, Betsy Krugliak, Pam Caton Miller, uh, Laura Eldridge, Ruth Berenson and Bria Kahana. That's our lineup, all-star lineup of brave women who are sharing their poetry with us. Um, first up at bat will be uh, our lovely friend, Jill. Where are you, Jill? I can't even see you. There you are, Jill. Um, so Jill is a very dear friend. She is a writer and a poet. Um, she did ask you first, so I think it's a it's um it's a it's a little unfair that the that the uh, self acclaimed poet goes first. <laughs> um, so don't feel like uh, there's any competition here. It's really just for us sharing our voices and our writings and being and being real with each other. Uh, for many years, she worked as a freelance music and arts journalist in New York, and in Providence, she staged a performance of personal poems alternating with text by Torah scholar Aviva Zomberg. Amazing! It was an amazing presentation. Um, she has written in a sequence called The Haunted History of Lithuania and a multimedia environmental work about vanishing French plane trees. She and Joanna Brown, who's next up, have mounted several poet resist readings. And my dear friend, Jill, you are up at that. Thank you everyone for coming. I love poetry and I'm so happy that we're doing this. Thank you, Alyssa. This poem is, um, for Aviva Zornberg, uh, it's called Our Nomad Father. Abraham Eyebright, wind keen. At light's wakefulness, a day of new steps ahead. Any trembling leaf could tell him about his perpetual leaving. Every road like spiders at their hour of spinning. So and so and so, a potent field of wise. Loosened by wandering, playing knuckle bones with villagers. One night he spilled about listening to black holes in the vacant sky, in Yahweh, in his flickering mind. Now crazy, asking the sunflowers, who planted the question? Who called him chaos? To vertigo of not knowing reaching for the unknowable star behind his ribs, spying rumors of thin blue light in the garden like skimmed milk. The dew does not drench him, so light it evaporates. Having been wetted, 
he produces moisture to quench his thirst. Who, this tough love? Who, the answer in the question? Yes, beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. That was based on a lecture that um, Aviva Zornberg gave uh, that I heard on Zoom. And I took it, played it, and put in a lot of images and um, turned it around and came out with that. Really and, lovely, thank you. Thanks guys. Do you, do you have another one, Jill, or that's, that's good? That's good. Okay, great, good. Thank you, thank you so much. Really, uh, I feel very calm already, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> thank you. Um, Joanna, um, let's see where I can find Joanna. There you are, Joanna, Joanna. Joanna's a physician and a writer living in Providence with her spouse and two sons. She has published poetry in publications such as uh, Gertrude, um, Eclectica Magazine, Earth's Daughters, and two Horatio chapbook series and Angel's Flight. And uh, I bumped into her at the gym today. So she's uh, also uh, uh, an avid worker out at the JCC. So it was nice to see you today. <laughs> and um, and uh, wherever you are, thank you for coming. <laughs> it's like you're somewhere where you need to wear a mask. So thank you, Joanna, for offering to share your words with us. Oh, thank you so, so much, Alyssa, for, for having this gathering and um, for including me. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I, um, uh, I feel honored to be following Jill, um, with whom I, I've hosted readings, that, as, she, as, as you pointed out um, in her uh, introduction. So um, I'm going to read, a, and I'm at uh, my, uh, my son's piano studio, so you may hear music. <laughs> um, so this is a poem about my um, sister and my aunt. Um, it's called My Sister Walking Down from the Bima at Our Aunt's Funeral. When my sister fans her face, a shadow of death passes through space. Her eulogy wafts a cool breeze, a speech she delivered with radiant ease. New life, new life. At 38 weeks, she's ripe subjected to the stress of speaking at this mess. Laughter, precious balm, restores a measure of calm, relieving so much tension, but missing the added dimension that the fanning wasn't funny. In fact, it was stunning the scary truth, what was happening to this granddaughter of Ruth. A pregnant woman is not allowed at the graveside where chunks of dirt clunk down on a box of pine and prayers to a merciful God are stolen by wind. A very pregnant woman should not deliver a eulogy, but who else could have brought out so much joy in descriptions of my aunt's flair for fashion, her writing, fun and boxy, her political passion. These papers bear words hammered through the night, molded, tempered. Now they graze a face, swollen, exhausted, dazed. I sing El Malay Rahamim, our mother's sister, in song. Oh, how we will miss her, but we, want, we must move on. Shekhina, magnanimous shade of cravings for shelter you're made. Covered by dancing white glowing letters, you must lift Ellen away. Glossy wings, mother of pearl. Flying is fun, have a whirl. Here is my sister getting slowly sicker not wanting to give birth today. When some air is displaced, other air rushes in. Does one soul's absence make room for another? After the funeral, I followed them to the hospital. We didn't tell my mother or father. Who by fire and who by water? Who by sword and who by wild beast? Who by hunger and who by thirst? Who by blood cells raging? and who by a placenta clenching. A new cry, a new name, the baby out, my sister heals. Still, I reach for my aunt's presence, her tall form, her voice. That's the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's very powerful. Thank you. And I like actually like the music in the back. It's kind of 
haunting. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good it's a good um audio effect in the back there <laughs> should appropriate that for the next time you do it <laughs> i know i don't know that i can produce it necessarily but yeah thank you thank, thank you joanna very very much so i don't know if you actually want to speak about how that came to be do you want to just give us a few words about how that came i uh, i mean i feel like I, a lot of it's in the poem it you know uh my, uh, unfortunately, my aunt died when she was um, 65 from leukemia. And my younger sister was very close with her um, and was very pregnant when she delivered the eulogy and then, um, you know, had uh, a pregnancy related illness, um, kind of severe preeclampsia that just suddenly started while she was at the funeral. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so it was kind of a, you know, just trying to describe the whole thing. Yeah. Well, so. you did it. You did it very beautifully. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Jen Stark. There, there you are, Jen. Nice to see you. A local artist and poet who has studied at McGill University, at RISD and Mass Art, and specialises in knitwear. When she's not in the studio, she's either in the kitchen making kosher Italian food, or playing Duolingo Italian and Hebrew. You can see some of her work on her website, and she's uh, a member of uh, Congregation Beth Shalom, and uh, she wears the best clothes. <laughs> Jen, you're up. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the poet part, I'm a hobbyist. I'm not a writer. As the, it's a tough act to follow here, but I'll do my best. Um, but it's interesting. We have a theme going. There's nothing specifically Jewish in this poem, but um, funeral poem following funeral poem. Um, this poem did come out of the experience I had um, dealing with my father's death a year ago as a Jew dealing with the death of a non-Jew that I had a complicated relationship with. So that was that was a thing that happened. That was fun. Um, but anyway, this is, this is a poem from that. And it's called The Box. I threw out today the old box of macaroni and cheese first found two weeks ago, not long after the funeral when we came here to get away. I let it linger thinking maybe I would eat it and share with my daughter that orange powdered nostalgia made fluid by milk and margarine. I hesitated because I knew it would be bad for me. So it sat until we returned today. And there it was saying, it's not so bad really. Well, surely these things never go bad completely. I surveyed the ingredients and thought, wow, how did I eat that over and over again? As a kid, I didn't recognize these things as toxic. They felt like nourishment and love. I turned and dropped the unopened box into the empty garbage can where it landed with a sudden pound, final as a black box in the ground. That's it. If it sounds like I ripped off a Billy Collins poem, I didn't specifically, but I was listening to his master class when I wrote that. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know what you're referring to, but I I, I like that. I, it was great. Thank you. It was really great. Thank you. I feel like we should have sort of like silence in between each one. I feel like I'm not quite ready to introduce the next person. Like we should sit with that for a minute. Uh, Francine, where are you? Somewhere there, it's Francine, I can't see yeah. you anyway. Oh, there you are. Um, Francine, uh, born in Bergen-Belsen in a displaced person camp in 1948, Francine has shared her story of growing up as a child of Holocaust survivors to multiple audiences, including middle and high school students through the Rhode Island Holocaust Center. Her compelling reiteration of life as an immigrant is told on the backdrop of her parents' experiences. She says, I've been writing since I was a child and used writing as a means of getting to say all the words that she never thought she had the courage to say. Writing provided the outlet for speaking her mind and finally being heard over the noise. For her, it means creating a legacy through her strongest emotions and desires. Fruma, as she is lovingly called by her family, is the mother of four and grandmother of eight. She's currently working on a program called Memories, designed for children to capture their family stories through interviewing, interviewing their parents, family members, and grandparents. Francine retired from a 30-year career working in higher education as Dean of the School of Professional and Continuing Studies, focusing on non-traditional students earning their undergraduate and graduate degrees. She holds a bachelor's degree from Bryant University and a master's from Leslie University, and she is my friend, and I introduce Francine. 
<laughs> so thank you. So, you know, I, I actually have written two things. One is a short piece and another is one that I wrote some time ago. And so for some reason, I picked the short piece first. Um, so just let me put the light on or not. Okay, it's not going. All right, so this one is called Purpose. The leaves on the trees begin to turn and the natural rhythm of nature brings me into a spiritual place of awe. How can this perfect balance of life be? It's not me. Without words, the natural order of life flows and the river is not filled with tears. It moves as it should, slowly, fiercely, calmly, knowing and trusting that it is as it should be, and it's not me. The darkness of the sky is illuminated by the stars. The mystery of life unfolds. Darkness holds the golden key. Fragile, afraid, opening, breathing, living, the struggle. If this is not me, then who am I? So that was um, a short piece that I wrote one morning. Um, I don't know if I know what inspires it, um, but, but it was just about uh, life. <laughs> and so that brought me to a bigger, a longer piece. And this isn't quite poetry, but I wanted to share it with you because um, it's part of a writer's group that I have had the courage to go into and it's called Awakening. It's early in the morning. The air is so crisp and clean. And I am in awe of how perfectly still the world seems to be as dawn is breaking. No noise, no words, no sound, just beauty unfolding for my eyes to see. In silence, I begin to feel my heart pound and I begin to hear a faint sound. Where is it coming from? I can't sense the direction but it's a low hum. It's filling the room and it's distracting me from this moment of peace. Peace, I wonder. I haven't known this place in such a long time. My days were filled with distraction, disturbing thoughts and such feelings of loneliness. So many regrets, hopes and dreams shattered. So why now does this hum want me to pay attention? I cringe with the thought that once again, I must take care of everything, be responsible for those I love and for those I don't. So what is love anyways? A feeling, a thought, a gesture, a moment of connection with another. Living, breathing, walking, talking, all seems so foreign to me. Why? My longing to feel life in its purest form continues to haunt me and I begin to feel death. It is all around me. The smell of death, of bodies piled up upon each other in a deep grave unmarked. Why now, when peace has just invited me in, I once again cannot escape this dream. And I wonder, where am I? Why does it feel so cold here? Why is my body beginning to shiver? Where is the warmth and the peace that has wrapped my body like a cocoon? Where is the safe, dark, warm place? Why is this so familiar to me? I begin to feel fear entering my body and my mind. No matter what I do, I can't escape this place. And then a shadow appears, faintly recognizable. But as it continues to grow, it leads me out of the mass grave. I know this place. The hum has brought me here. That's my piece. So this um, piece is, um, I had a reoccurring dream as a child. Um, and this is a dream that I'll have periodically that I too, even though I didn't experience the Holocaust, my parents did. So um, the hum is actually the gas chambers. So. That's my piece. Francine, thank you so much for sharing that. It's really 
really profound. I feel like we all should listen to all this over again in the recording. There's so much power and so much depth and so much heart and soul in each poem. It's really, really deep. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Um, Cynthia, you're up next, <laughs> my love. <laughs> Uh, relatively recent transplant to Providence, Cynthia Scheinberg uh, came in uh, 2018 after living for um, 26 years in Northern California. Uh, she's professor of English literature at Roger Williams University, uh, stepped down from being a dean six months ago. She's published widely um, in the fields of 19th century Jewish and Christian British women's poetry, Anglo-Jewish writers and religion and poetry, and she's received fellowships from the Harvard Divinity School and the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancements of Teaching, among others. She's married to Rabbi Eliyahu Klein, has one daughter, Gavi, and is about to graduate from Brandeis. And this poetry that she will, well, you introduce it, Cynthia, you tell yeah, us. Yeah, I will, yeah. So this was great fun. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for pulling this off because these are poems from about 30 years ago, which took me a while to find, you can imagine, in the move and all of that. Um, and I'm I'm hopeful that they are going to this event and doing this will help propel me back into into some poetry, hopefully. So, but it was pretty interesting to find these from a very old other time in my life. So, um, I have two short sonnets and uh, one or two other short ones to read. Um, and I was very interested in writing sonnets back then. So, um, this was part of a a series, but I'm just reading this one. The, it was that we had lost our sense of grace. Think of Fred Astaire suddenly stumbling, trotting on his partner with a grimace. Imagine Ginger Rogers cross and grumbling. In our case, Ginger would still be angry weeks later on a new set and she would try to guard her feet imperceptibly and Fred would know why and bristle and brood. Without graciousness, Loving someone takes that sweet feeling of intimate knowing and channels it toward predicting mistakes. Like betting on a horse you see showing lameness. When he gets too sore and breaks stride, you lose, but love your insight with smug pride. Um, I'll save the other sonnet to last. So I think I must have been doing some research and I came across a headline that was House of David Slugger Steals Home. And so that is the title of this poem, House of David Slugger Steals Home. You come to a new land with vague ideas of how it will be, a place where your wife will make her grandmother's recipes, where your sons can marry and prosper. But there are things you haven't counted on. Language matters more than you'd realized. Finding yourself once again on the wrong streetcar, confused and holding up a line of people who mutter dumb Jaime barely under their breath. Your son starts bringing home the local paper, frantic for the box scores and finding strange new heroes. He'll still go to shul but you have to yank the big pink bubbles from his mouth. Oh, some nice surprises too. When your wife announces she's pregnant with a new citizen, the arrival of your cousins still whole, unharmed, a miracle, or the day you discovered you could hit the ball over the outfielder's head, something you never imagined, your son cheering and waving you to third, and when that big Mick pitched the ball right past his catcher, you saw your opportunity. Digging hard in the deep sand, you knew for those eight seconds exactly where you were. Um, this one is funny, I hope. <laughs> um, some of you will probably even recognize the setting. Uh, it's called The Breath of Spring, a Pastoral. It's spring. In the gym of the Raritan Valley Young Men and Women's Hebrew Association, we wheeze and sprout pale limbs. All year we have mulched our bodies in black spandex, but now as the intrepid crocus thrusts its way out from under pounds of dirt, we expose our goosebumped skin as we pulse our pelvises. We do whatever the instructor shouts, 
Squeeze it tighter, push it harder, don't forget to breathe. She shepherds us towards virtue, accompanied by a disco rendition of Temptation Nights, and we are grateful, though we hate her. She reminds us that the summer which follows spring is full of demands and asks if we are doing our sit-ups at home. It's a hard season this spring. The sun wilts that crocus who was already limp after a near miss with frost the day before, and we worry knowing that when the semester ends for Passover, our ritual in the gym will be over too. We'll have to struggle with our fleshly selves on beaches and cope with the tightness in our chests when we see the bodies that are truly firm. There'll be no voice reminding us to breathe. We'll miss the stuffy gym, our com comrades under wraps, and the parable of that damn crocus who driven only by faith in seasonal logic tries hard to work out vanity and live. And I'll end <laughs> with another one that's actually also flower related. If I can find it, where is it? This is another sonnet, so it's short. And again, I think I must have seen a, I think there was an ad campaign. People might remember florists turn feelings into flowers. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but I do. Um, Florists turn feelings into flowers. Could pain be a single lily leaning in a cold glass of water or joy a flame colored aster plucked at the height of spiky bloom? Some things are exactly valuable because they do not turn into anything or anyone but you. And though the abracadabra is surely tempting, that man in a tuxedo pulling daisies from an empty fist. My friend, sometimes resist the switch and bait and concentrate on forcing nothing from the bud about to burst into your grief or loving. Thanks everybody. That was Yay, great. Yay, well Thanks. done. Really good, wonderful. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I, I need a laugh after some of the other. <laughs> The other the offerings which were so deep and 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 this was a, a nice a lot of good imagery in that one there Cynthia thank you all right uh, Betsy 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 Krugliak is our next um, presenter and and thank you all of you really so much um, psychologist and neuropsychologist working uh, with two medical practices in Spanish and English. Uh, Betsy moved here five years ago, also from California, from the San Francisco area, after raising a son and her daughter. She was active in the Jewish community in California on the board of her temples and also worked with Jewish organizations on grassroots and public affairs projects. She has had a varied career, um, was a CEO and founder of a marketing and public affairs company and even working in DC, in DC on the Hill. And um, she is um, somewhere here and um, you're up, my dear friend, Betsy. Or are you have idea. I, I'm not sure why I'm here. <laughs> These are two really simple little things, but it's wonderful to be here and to hear everybody. All right, the first one is uh, happened when I was a child and it was my idea of the first time I heard the voice of God. It is called the corner of then and now. They're very short. I was seven chasing leaves down our street in the fall. When the wind hit the corner just right, the leaves became wings and cradled me up into clouds of sunlight. What's this, who's there? I asked, trying to find a face in those clouds. Then I heard your voice when you spoke my name out loud. You were calling me, calling me till I could finally see you're always here with me. So many years to come of chasing, dreaming, searching for that same corner of then and now till I realized I could just be and believe without asking why or how. You were calling me calling me till I could finally see you're always here with me. That's the first one. The second one is a, <laughs> is a, uh, a poem I wrote that I put to music. Uh, I used to sing this to my children and I don't, I, I mean, they're in their thirties and 
how they endured it all those years, I don't know. But uh, so I had someone, I hired someone and I put it to music and had someone sing it. It was so lovely. And uh, I have no idea where that recording is on a little cassette tape. But if I ever find it, I'll, I'm sure it would sound nice. So tonight we're just going to hear the words. And it's called Lullaby. When I hold my baby as she falls asleep, those newborn eyes are sure I'm hers for keeps. She's like a brand new moon that found its world today. And I, I wonder who she'll be someday. Sleep, baby, sleep, so safe and warm. Stay, baby, stay in mama's arms. When I watch my little girl play outside, she can talk to the birds with a look in her eye. She'll make a brand new world from a handful of clay. And I know just who she'll be someday. Sleep, baby, sleep, so safe and warm. Stay, baby, stay in mama's arms. When I hear my big girl say goodbye, She's bound for a world she wants to know. She'll give life the breath I gave her long ago. And I know just why I love her so. Sleep, baby, sleep, so safe and warm. Wish you could stay, baby, stay in mama's arms. That's it. <laughs> really beautiful, really calming and I feel like all warm and I want to be in a warm soft space <laughs> takes us back to our childhoods thank you um Pam Pam our Betsy Cynthia Betsy Pam Pam Caitlin Miller somewhere you are somewhere um has lived in Rhode Island for the past 41 years but is a New Yorker a New Yorker by birth and nature She's been a member of Temple Emmanuel for all the time, currently serves as the v VP for religious engagement. Pam and her husband, Sam, have three children and five grandchildren. She's a medical social worker and cared for both of her parents at the end of their lives. She began writing poetry as she was processing her mother's death. And Pam was also actually one of the, um, the first people to jump on the idea of doing a poetry night and shared a um, number of her poems with me. So I'm excited to hear what you have to share with us today now, Pam. Thank you. Um, so I also uh, don't feel like somehow I belong because I'm in such a company that I would, these are just writings that I did after my mother died. I needed to think about uh, our relationship, which was not always an easy one. So I'm going to share three three uh, poems. I wrote a poem a month during um, during my month of uh, my, my year of mourning and then um, every year after that. So this one is called Minion. I go evening after evening, morning after morning, day after day, and there are so many words, the same words evening after evening, morning after morning, day after day, and the words, the sheer number of them agitate me. And I sit staring into space with my arms folded across my chest until it's time to stand and say the words reserved only for those in mourning. When I'm less triggered, I meditate and I let nothing flow, nothingness flow over me. But when God opens my eyes, there is holiness everywhere. There is holiness in watching people assist a disabled man to don his tefillin. There is holiness in hugging a total stranger standing alone on the first anniversary of his young son's death. There is holiness in the bantering of the regulars as they tease and care for one another. And there is so much holiness in looking into the eyes of the people who come to make a minion for no other reason and to ensure that there are 10. So I can stand and proclaim God's holiness. It is then that I see the miracles that surround me evening, morning, and afternoon. It is then that I can see God's great love, which leads me back to prayer. That was my first poem um, for my, the first month. And this is after six months. It's six months today. I awake early and think, 
Was this the time you went outside for your last cigarette? The smoke that did not kill you, but only contributed to your last illness? Was this the time that your belly slowly began bleeding internally? Was this the time you knew it was going to be your last day? Is this the time you looked at your husband of 63 years and told him, this is it, goodbye? I know the time you died. I don't know what you were thinking. Were you glad the pain was going to end? Were you glad to finally stop fighting? Were you scared? Would you have been less so if I had been there? I sit on the beach in Mexico at sunrise and try to pray, but pray for what? For some peace, my questions and wondering, for peace for your soul when you had almost none during your lifetime, for what? I just don't know. And then the last poem I will share with you is, hmm, is it's called You Were Right. I wanna tell you, you were right. You were right when you told me you'll miss me when I'm gone, but you never told me how much it would ache. You didn't warn me about all the times I'd long to pick up the phone to share a tale about the grandchildren or the people at work or about my life. How I'd have fewer episodes of rollicking laughter without you to share the joke. You never mentioned how much I'd wanna tell you about my newest favorite book even if you would have never read it and likely have hated it if you had. Did you know or somehow omit that after four years, I'd still become teary looking up at a sky blue pink sunrise because it was your favorite color? Could you have imagined how angry I'd become? I'm angry that just when I learned to truly appreciate you for all your complexities, your biting sarcasm along with your generous spirit, your fierce independence along with your incredible stubbornness, and most of all, the regal grace you showed in the acceptance of the unacceptable, that just when you truly learned to see me and appreciate me for all my flaws and strengths, you were gone in a puff of smoke. The candle burns, but doesn't need to remind me of what I've lost. Oh, thank you, Pam, really. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for sharing all that. I, mean, I guess, I don't know if anybody wants to unmute and say anything. I, I feel like I'm just like moving along, but um, I, again, I feel like some of these you need to sit with for a minute. Thank you, Pam. Um, Laura, my friend, Laura Eldridge um, lives in East Greenwich. Um, she didn't give me much of a bio, so maybe um, I'll just ad lib a little bit. Um, she's a teacher at URI of, uh, in, of literature and writing, I think. Uh, she's, written, she's written a lot. Um, she came on a trip to Israel um, that I was, honored to lead a few years ago. And uh, we've maintained our relationship since then, which is really meaningful to me. And um, so I invited Laura to share some of her poetry with us. I have to unmute yourself, Laura. Yes, I did. Yes, so um, I do write, but I don't write poetry. So um, actually uh, this continues a tradition of Alyssa, um, who was able to get me to do things that no one else could get me to do. <laughs> So I have two, um, I have three, but I think I'll just do the two. Um, so the first one is a COVID poem um, called Rain Check. Um, of course, we'll try again some other day. Granted, it's not safe. We'll have to wait. We'll learn to live with infinite delay. Is it October, January, May? I lose time, I stay up far too late. Of course, I'll see you soon, some other day. Aunt's birthday, friend's wedding, regrets conveyed. It just won't work right now. The time's not great. We learn to love indefinite delays. Forgetting friends we made in day to day, alighting those that gave less joy than weight. Of course, we'll try again some other day. Hope unfeathered, uh, reticent and gray. Each time the cases rise or stats update, we can't avoid indefinite delays. The feel of crisis and a slow decay, not a disaster, not the worst of fates. Of course, another time, another day, our lives between indefinite delays. So that's that one. 
Um, and the second one is a New Year's poem um, called Counter Resolutionaries. But it's also kind of a COVID poem too, I guess, I don't know. Um, <laughs> today we are unable to resolve things. Despite this season of I solemnly swear, of I commit to waking at seven, to six rides a week, no sugar, no flour. Today, this stated hope for change, for action towards outcome seems premature. Today, we are unable to resolve things, each choice, like a cherry dripping in syrup that may be ambrosia or might be arsenic. Either way, it will thrill the tongue with its sting. In either case, it promises sleepy, convulsive delight. To do or not to do is the exhausting, enduring question. Today, we are unable to resolve things without each should or shouldn't just accruing us, each yes or no, a grain of sand that drifts from the castle back to the sea. I know a young man who spends his nights exploring abandoned ruins. He said he loves the fear of falling beams, of feet crashing through rotted staircase. Today we are unable to resolve things. We leave the house to molder, refuse repair, and teach our children to love the mildew. Today we are unable to resolve things. So says the angry voice at the committee meeting or comment left even after a second, third thought it sits weeping like a sore that tells of more. This family dinner, more like a battlefield, minefield. No, we will not resolve this. Not here, not today. Tonight, I do not want to resolve things. That word you said, that thing I couldn't resolve to keep silent still hangs in the air. But also here in this moonlight, in this Time as one year softly yields, I feel your hand in mine and I know that with you, all the grainy, shaky me's that have been and will be resolved. It tells about the year that's passed and the person who entered the new one, which you feel more at the start, the glow of fresh yet to be's or the sense of something slipping irrecallably away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Beautiful. Ooh, thank you, Laura. That, it doesn't seem like you don't write poetry. Just saying. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that. Um, Ruth Berenson, somewhere there is Ruth Berenson, who's uh, probably been involved in every Jewish nonprofit in Providence uh, for the last um, number of years. <laughs> uh, she's a retired clinical social worker. Busier than ever with her family, her four grandchildren, rowing on the Seekonk River and making her world a joyful place. Um, Ruth Berenson, you are up. And you didn't say the most important thing. Oh, what? She does not think of herself as a poet. Oh, right. Well, everybody said that. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. But we started with poets. <laughs> but that is really true for me because the I had this incredibly strange experience a few days before Thanksgiving where uh, a few lines came to me and um, I'll share what came out of that. And then a second thing that came out of writing that, okay? And um, I would be happy to try to answer questions, Alyssa, from anybody when I'm finished. And if I don't want to say, I'll just say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to discuss that. No. Okay, so this poem is called Mine. I have zipped and unzipped thousands, wished for a spray can to apply snow, snow suits to littles, taught bunny ties and loops around loops, seen heartache and success, felt the bittersweet moments of development changed bittersweet to joy and back again. Lived through a tunnel of desperate blackness, tentacles reaching for blood. Finally, a glimmer, a sliver of moon at the unreachable distance, mouth filled with bitter earth, struggling to breathe, crawled for my life, emerging with deep cuts, knowing the gratefulness of scars worth fighting for. Many incarnations of personhood, hats of beliefs, twirls and whirls of interests, 
dancing on a lily pad, hippopotamus on point in white tutu spins as the elegant dragonflies flit, land and rise again, skilled helicopters. Which green trampoline next? When will hippo swim? When solid with a plie? Steadied by mothers, fathers, distant ancestors, close intimates, friendships gardened, weeded, seeded, blooming pink and yellow and golden green, buoyed by endless blue, soft, wholly ever-changing whites and rain given just in time. Child of black patent leather, shining good girl who knew how to look down what orders to follow, behavior, emotion, thought, judged by polarity. When do I no longer feel the demands of predestined roles, gladly accepted, always above average, smiling through it all, awareness of a growing seed of imaged spheres and infinite shades of gray, room for self, comfort with ambiguity, Selflessness, where the heart stays intact. The knowledge where my skin ends and yours begins. And then a stroke or swirls water or a loaded brush, velvet clay under palms. Only this stroke suspended in time and expectation. An opening of confident surprising. No past, no future far from the visceral experienced construct of time, possibility of awe, space to notice, a full breath held by the universe, this moment for me alone, connected. That was the first one. And then um, one morning at 4 a.m. I woke up recently and I do typically I'm a morning person thank goodness because when you row you get very used to getting up um before five o'clock in the morning um but clearly these days it's very dark and I actually uh found a cozy spot for myself and it as dawn approached this sort of happened the name of the poem is Surprise, as if you were going to a surprise birthday party. Surprise, wordsmith, <clears throat> wordsmith, never. Can't spell to save my life. So what is this? Words on a page? Let them soar, let them struggle. Have confidence they will come. Not painted nor made of clay, nor extinguished in a burst of energy. Feelings formed, shaped, appearing by pencil, thought. The why appears late after making. Why now? What's the meaning of this moment? The rush to create again? Is it the sight of the shortened future? You have done what you could, like a steel worker or magician. Legacy. That's it. Beautiful, pet, beautiful, Ruth. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to actually ask the whole questions till we um, finish because um, I know that uh, Bria is here waiting for her poem. And then if we want to have a conversation, I think that would be perfect for that. So um, I'd like to introduce Bria. Um, and again, I, I, I want to reiterate how super lovely this is to be able to hear the your voices of women that are in our community and, and hear you speak in, in such... Um, poetic ways and, and ways that reveal a lot more about who you are than when you meet at the supermarket or you meet at the Kiddush. Like it's such a nice revelation of, of what a wonderful community we live in and who's around us. So thank you all for, for sharing your poetry with us. Um, so um, our, our final speaker, who I'm excited to, um, to hear, um, her name is Bria Kahana. She's a new, a new person in our midst in, in the Providence community. Um, she actually lives in New York. Um, she's a third year student at Yeshiva Maharat in New York, uh, where she learns Torah and Gemara and um, all things 
text and Jewish and intermingled with her pastoral care. Uh, she has a master's in biblical interpretation, Parsha Nut. She is passionate about expanding the discourse of Judaism by centering women and marginalized individual stories through the theological lens of inclusivity, as well as bringing more arts into our sacred spaces. She has worked as a doula, as a Hebrew scribe, as a bar and bat mitzvah tutor, and uh, she is presently interning at Congregation Beth Shalom as a maharat in training, and I've had the pleasure of um, hanging out with her sometimes and speaking with her. So I'm very excited to introduce you to uh, Bria Kahana. Thank you, Alyssa, um, and for everyone who went before me. Um, my poem is related to a dream that I had recently, and this is it. How elegantly elongated and poised with wizened knowing and tender eyes you sat. So still that the sweetened dust filled my nostrils with alluring nostalgia, like a photograph yellowed and loved. How my fingers would gently caress the flattened postcard sized face imprinted on my thumb, as if I could transport back to that moment where you rocked my baby self in your arms. This is your Saba. He chuckled and called you Tanhum, sleepy one, dreamer. Do not let the image fall into obscurity. What dreams may tell. But here you emerged again, statuesque, looking straight at me, reposed at the head of the simple wooden table, white cloth ruffling our knees in jest at this serious encounter, a mere series of seconds. This oneeric ohel moed, place of meeting between worlds, chai vemet, holy and anticipatory, like Jacob surrounded by his future, matovu ohalecha Yaakov. All of us grandchildren and you held our breaths at this dream reunion 18 years later, Shabbos vayechi, a hundred years after your birth, when you awakened into consciousness, a life unknown ahead of you and kin you had yet to create and meet. What dreams may tell. You part the silence with your dry lips, asking us, what is the Torah of your hearts? A heavy question weighed unanswered, Yom Hadin. It is a characteristic request, one you made of us when we were small and you alive, wanting to bridge your past life in a Hasidic cheder in Sfat with our North American modern and permeable upbringing. But I grow nervous, scrambling my mind for an answer, not having prepared the parsha, much less this moment. After all, you have been buried for so long and I have so longed for this moment. But who knew this was when you'd appear? And this is what you'd ask, what dreamers may tell. I try to reroute the attention with a defensive, protective response. Not all of us are becoming rabbis, I cry out. Embarrassment, oofed. Why was this what fell from my mouth? A rock set on the table, a meager offering. The Ohel Moed portal darkened, the Ner Tamid teetered on and off pushed away by fear of disappointment and fear of a holy earnest encounter. In the white spaces, I beseech him not to judge us, even though not, of all, not all of us share his dream or have followed his path, but could it have been different? It is, is it even what's desirable? Did he also choose a path different from his ancestors, responding to the truth in his heart and embracing life? And please see how we are all good, gleaning from the past and processing the present. By watching others, I see in time, the courses of our lives becoming solidified, becoming our destinies if we choose them. And maybe even more so when you have young ears listening to your stories of trials and survival. In the white space, I ask, can you still give us your blessing, dear Saba, for where we are and who we are, no longer idealizing, but just as we are? 
you understand the white spaces, what dreams may tell. You respond without insult, carefully articulating this message. I will tell you my Torah, sweet children, and that is that everything I do is for God. Cryptic, yet classic, I knew he was a chassid at heart. You sing the song of your life into our pounding ears. You are not looking for me or any of us to recite a passage of Talmud or know all the Rashis in the book. Your legacy is that we speak truthfully, go where we need to go in life for the sake of bringing holiness, Kedusha, here in this moment. This was a lesson you took, distilled, and weaved into your life and from the other side wanted to impart. This is your bracha to us. Find me again in another dream so we can speak longer and later into the morning awakenings. I will prepare to ask what it is like where you are. How is your mother who was ripped from you in your youth? How is Safta? And I will try to be softer to share what songs are steeping in my heart, trying to navigate this complex world of many opinions and machlokets. Help me find the truth I may live by, balancing l'shem shemaim v'aretz as the path grows into my destiny, wholly mine and ours, what dreams may tell. Wow, great, wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Bria, for coming from New York. Thank you, local ladies, for being here. I want to share the last poem and then if anybody wants to unmute themselves and just um, reflect or share their own thoughts, that would be lovely. Um, I want to read the poem that Elizabeth Oakes read at the Thanksgiving night, because I think it's, um, it was a, it's a little bit of the top and tail of this event. Um, so here it is. This is written by Elizabeth Oakes um, of November, 2021. These are the things that are too easy to take for granted. And they are the things that I would miss most of all. Access to healthcare, education, home, heat, food, clothing, freedom to express my identity and opinions without fear of violence. Right now, I know that there are families sleeping in cars, walking in deserts and jungles towards freedom, hiding at homes because they fear for life, looking in trash bins for food, the privilege I have is so deep and so extensive that when I'm asked to think and share about my gratitude, I get to think of the beautiful, tender and minute details of life. The ones that you can take time and energy to notice and see when you are living on stable ground. Moment one, I'm struggling, I'm snuggling next to my five-year-old son at bedtime and he is mid-sentence and drifts off to sleep listening to his breath, his resting eyes. His energy is both so absent and present at once. This moment when parenting is about stillness, just being a witness to breath and release. Moment two, I often walk the Blackstone Park through the wooded paths and down along the Seekonk River. The sky is layers of blues and purples and pinks. The water is glittering, spots of elated light. I still, I see a still bird, perhaps a duck, a great blue heron, absolutely still and appearing to want or need nothing, as if to ask, what's the rush? Don't you know you have everything you need? It doesn't ask me if I deserve to see its beauty, nor do I expect it to put on a show. We are still nature beings together, nature beings together. Moment three. A week ago, my niece and nephew, 13 year old twins had their bar and bat mitzvah. I was sitting in their synagogue, listening to them chant Torah. Each time they hit a particular note, they would hold it for one, two, three, four, five seconds or more. I felt a collective holding of breath, my mom and dad sitting next to me. Who would have known a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, that we would be sitting together? 
my husband by my side, my son on my lap. I sense that even my almost 90 year old grandma zooming in from many states away was too. My niece and nephew's notes were powerful, holy, demanding presence, reclaiming space. Mary Oliver, one of my rabbis wrote, I go down to the shore in the morning and depending on the hour, the waves are rolling in or moving out. And I say, oh, I am miserable. What shall, what should I do? And the sea says in its lovely voice, excuse me, I have work to do. Indeed, there is so much work to do within myself, in my community, in the world, but I hold these grateful moments in my pockets, in my breath, in my connections. And all I can say is, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was Elizabeth Oakes's uh, poem from Thanksgiving program we did. So I don't know if anybody wants to unmute and say hello or have any comments, or I just think it's such a lovely, I didn't realize how lovely this was gonna be. Um, it had so much potential and it's really actualized that potential we've heard, you know, we've, we've, we've laughed and we've, and we've sat in connection, soul connection, heart connection, um, listening to sleep and holiness and death and meditation and God and dreams and lives and truth and hearts and women in black spandex. <laughs> Anybody want to say anything? It's really, it's really nice to hear all the, the different variations and um, all the different ways, voices, words, kind of the natural imprint that people's put on from soul to words and each one kind of just very, it couldn't be otherwise in a certain way. And, and that's what, uh, that's what's really great to hear. I really enjoyed it. Thank Everyone, you so much, Alyssa, for the vision. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Okay, I'm open to more ideas. Anybody has any ideas of uh, how to, what to meet over next time? What to, what to what to what to focus on? What to think about? What to share? How to be how to be a community that's beyond any boundary that is unbounded? Is that a word? <clears throat> All right. Well, we did we did a full hour. Really amazing. Wonderful. I know we all just enjoy looking at each other, right? <laughs> It was wonderful well, to hear. It really was. It was a it was a privilege to listen to these poets and to share these quiet moments of thought and insight. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Alyssa. Agreed. Do it again. Yeah. yeah, I also want to thank you. I thought it was very beautiful, very special, and maybe it'll be the impetus for many of us to write some poetry so that we can do it again six months from now. Please God, sounds good. And maybe in person. How about a moth hour? Should we do a moth hour? Yeah. It's a moth hour. Oh my it's gosh, that's a great idea. Sharing stories. Storytelling. Storytelling. Beautiful. Well, um, thank you all. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, sorry, Pam, go. I, I have something else. Pam, go. When Rabbi Fell became uh, installed at Temple Emmanuel, he wanted a different kind of installation. And so we did a moth story hour oh. and it was wonderful. So I'm happy to help you if you want to do that. Right, wonderful. I do want to acknowledge that actually uh, the idea was to do this, like to have a program on Rosh Chodesh. So yesterday was Rosh Chodesh, uh, which is the new moon. And um, if you look up at the sky, I don't know if you've had a chance, it's beautiful tonight. It's a clear sky and, the, and it's just this slither of moon. It's this, this beginning of the, of the new moon coming into fullness. So in two weeks, it'll be um, Tubishvat um, when the moon will be full. And that's um, the beginning of all the stirrings that are going on under the cold frozen earth is gonna 
start uh, start now moving so that we can enter into spring on time and have everything um, bud and bloom and um, and take us through the cycles. But this cycle of, of 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 the moon waxing and waning, and that we as women have this holiday of uh, recognizing the moon and sanctifying the moon and seeing it waxing and waning, as do we as individuals wax and wane. So um, I see this as a as a fullness, <laughs> even though there's only a sliver of moon outside. <clears throat> Just a thought. Thank you, poet Alyssa. Yeah. So welcome to uh, welcome to the month of Shvat. And, Thank uh, you so much. Wishing everybody a beautiful week, and I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all for participating. Bye. Thank you, Alyssa. This was lovely.